Hi, my name is Norm Friesen, and I'm here to talk to you today about something called pedagogical tact. Pedagogical tact is an idea that has been discussed in education and in discourses of pedagogy for over 200 years. And so what I'm going to do in this introduction is provide an overview of the history and talk about how conceptions of tact have changed over time and what they mean today. I'm going to start by uh, t turning to Adorno, actually, Theodore Adorno of the Frankfurt School, um, because he talks about something he calls the dialectic of tact. He sees this dialectic as going back and forth between two poles. One of them is the bourgeois individual, the unique individual. The other pole is custom or convention that is that is no longer perfect or completely valid, but still important. Then I'm going to talk about pedagogical tact from the perspective of Johann Friedrich Herbert. He was the person who first came up with the idea of pedagogical tact, and he understood it, again, in a kind of dialectical way as mediating between theory and practice in teaching. Then, uh, just a few years later, Schleiermacher talks about tact, specifically as a balancing of opposites in education. Schleiermacher sees the field of education, both in theory and practice, as being constituted by tensions between opposites. And tact, he saw, as, a, as being a way of, of mediating and balancing these opposites. Then pedagogical tact remained a topic of interest for over 100 years. However, there were very few or not any scholars who really developed it in a fruitful direction. The, the exception to this arose in the 1930s, specifically with a guy named Hamann Noll. He understood tact as being the distance between the teacher or the educator and the one being educated. Then, just a few years later, after the Second World War was finished, uh, Elizabeth Blochmann published two articles on pedagogical tact. And there she described pedagogical tact in terms of gelassenheit, or um, letting be, or releasement. And then in 1962, a guy named Jakob Muth uh, published a book on pedagogical tact that, where he talks about this kind of tact as taking the form of sensitivity and reserve. Finally, what we have in the last 10 years or so is a kind of renaissance in the notion of pedagogical tact, renewed interest, renewed publications. And what, uh, what these pu publications do is very interesting. They both talk about pedagogical tact as a kind of a way of understanding pedagogical problems. The first of these published in 2017 by Eric Piria is named, is uh, focuses on uh, La Pédagogie des de Dilemmes, um, and Amparia un, understands pedagogical tact as a kind of pedagogical and relational virtue, and he understands tact as being something that people can learn um, or acquire by engaging on a, in a pedagogy of dilemmas. Similarly, two, auth two German authors, um, Jochen Zirfas and the first author is Daniel Burkhardt, talk about pedagogical tact as a problem formal or a problem formula or just a problem that is uh, that or a way of problem problematizing things in in pedagogy in terms of pedagogical practice and theory then at the end i'm going to leave you with the question about why tact is still important today before i embark on my presentation, though, I'm going to just say a little bit about myself. I'm someone who studied Germanistic. I did my master's degree and my uh, and a bachelor's degree in German language literature and philosophy. Um, however, I earned my PhD in education, and I've focused on educational technology since that time. However, I've also been um, more recently been translating key documents and key writings from uh, the German into English that discuss or that are important for the tradition of pedagogy. And what I'm trying to do in those, in those translations and publications 
is to introduce German continental pedagogic to English speakers. The reason that I'm interested in doing that is because pedagogic, or as it's known in, in, in French, pedagogie, or uh, also has equivalent uh, terms, cognates in uh, Italian and Spanish, for example, this uh, term or the ideas that are behind this term are not actually understood or known in the, in the English speaking world. And it has a special value because it's the only discourse that I know about that actually focuses on education from an educational perspective. It defines an educational perspective and it sees education not in terms of um, psychology, uh, a question of efficiency, a question of increasing learning outcomes. Also, it sees education not just something as a field for political and policy uh, development. Instead, it looks at education from the perspective of the relationship between the two generations, the older and the younger generation, and the uh, issues and concerns that arise from that. So, to my presentation. Theodore Adorno described a dialectic of tact. And here's, what he, here's how he defined it. Tact, he said, we now know, has its precise historical hour. It was the hour when the bourgeois individual rid himself of absolutist compulsion. Free and solitary, this bourgeois individual answers for himself, while the forms of hierarchical respect and consideration developed by absolutism, um, developed by a aristocracy and, and king, for example, were divested of their economic basis and their menacing power and were just sufficiently present to um, allow for or to guide tactful action. So what Adorno was saying, um, as I mentioned already, is that we have the bourgeois individual on the one hand who is seeking um, recognition and respect. And on the other hand, we have a set of conventions and traditions that are not entirely present, um, but still survive. Here's how Adorno puts this situation. The precondition of tact is convention, no longer intact, yet still present. Or in German, Voraussetzung des Tags ist die in sich gebrochene und doch noch gegenwärtige Konvention. So we will see this pattern emerge or be, be manifest uh, multiple times over the course of the history of tact uh, and of pedagogical tact. So what's this about the bourgeois individual that Adorno was talking about? Well, this can be represented through the term Bildung um, and also the, the genre um, of the Bildungsroman or the coming of age novel. These t the, both the novel form, the, the bourgeois individual and uh, the, the Bildungsroman um, all emerged uh, at the end of the 18th century. And this happened in some ways because one could say uh, the bourgeois individual himself or herself was emerging. And here's how one literary interpreter or critic understands uh, the, the bourgeois individual in the context of the Bildungsroman. For these people, these bürger, um, these bourgeois, only their individuality was their essential characteristic. From their individuality, they derived their life goal, their definition and social norms. The intensification of subjectivity the discovery and valorization of human interiority came together with the emergence of privacy, the possibility of a retreat from society, and a new meaning for solitude. Solitude was not just a question of cutting oneself off, but as a source, it was a source of a pleasure. So some of the key terms here are privacy, interiority, self-definition, and I would add to that social mobility. So the bourgeois individual is not defined by the group to which he belongs, as would have been the case for um, people belonging to different um, clans and classes. They are able to define their identity for themselves to a certain extent and are able, above all, to understand themselves in terms of being an individual. So in this context, the word tact, in just in a general sense, arose. and. It happened fairly early in the time frame that I'm looking at, specifically during the Enlightenment. So 
of the French Enlightenment, for example, was led in part by Voltaire. And he used the word tact in as follows. The man of taste, the connoisseur of the arts, in other words, has other e eyes, other ears, and another tact from the uncultivated man. So it seems to be a sort of a sensitivity and a kind of ability to make distinctions. In the Scottish Enlightenment, which happened a little bit later than the French Enlightenment, a philosopher named Dugald Stewart wrote, the use made in the French tongue of the word tact denotes that delicate sense of propriety which enables a man to feel his way in the difficult intercourse of polished society. And so with Stewart, tact becomes not just a question of making distinctions, but a question of using a, a similar sensitivity in social contexts and engaging with others. And this becomes important precisely because of the mobility and the self-definition that are part of the bourgeois individual and the bourgeois society, where people can um, be socially mobile, can move from one class to another. So Herbot is the first guy to talk about tact in a pedagogical context. He defines pedagogical tact in terms of theory and practice in his lectures to student teachers from 1802. And here's what he says. I'm going to read this through and then break it down for you. But for every theorist who puts his theory into practice, in particular cases, a link intermediate between theory and practice involuntarily inserts itself. By this, I mean a certain tact, a quick judgment and decision that is not habitual. And here he uses the word schlendrian. It's not habitual and it's not eternally uniform. But this tact is unable to boast, as a fully developed theory should, that while remaining deliberately consistent with the rule, it can at the same time answer the true requirements of the individual case. This tact is a mode of action that is dependent on feeling, but, only, but that only remotely relies on certainty of belief. So what he's saying here is that this tact arises from a kind of feeling. And this tact also is something that that allows one to act quickly and to make decisions quickly um, that are improvisational, that are something new and different. Um, at the same time, these, these decisions and these actions are ones that, that are able to meet the true requirements of the individual case. So they're, they're directed towards the student and the child as an individual. Also, this pedagogical tact, he says, remains deliberately consistent with the rule, with the theory. And what it does, in effect, is it serves as a link that connects theory and practice. And uh, let me show you a diagram that helps to schematize this. On the one hand, we have at the top of an in a dark yellow, we have a, a part of education that is called that could be called theory or science. And also it has the attributes of being general and universal. At the bottom in the green square, we have practice or what Herbert called art. And this relates to the particular and the individual. And <clears throat> Herbert defines science, um, the, the universal part, as an orderly combination of propositions, logically constituting a whole in which results are derived from these propositions. Science therefore requires philosophic thinking. So in other words, theory and science is not just simply that something that is instantly available to us when we need to act. Instead, it requires careful philosophical thinking. However, we can still do things that are in keeping with science, with the theories that, of education that, um, that, are, that guide our action, we can still do that through tact, a quick judgment and decision that respects theory, maintains uh, the rule, um, but that at the same time meets the true requirements of the individual case, the individual pedagogical situation. And art um, refers here to action in keeping with the propositions of science. So that emphasis on action becomes something um, important in the history of tact. So just a few years later, a couple of decades later, 
Um, Daniel Friedrich Ernst Schleiermacher talked about tact in the context of some lectures he gave on education. There he defines tact as a general mediator of order and measure. It's a way of, he says, balancing between two extremes. And it works unconsciously. So he's saying something similar to what Herbot was saying about it being more dependent on an implicit feeling rather than an explicit uh, belief or conviction. And it attempts to stand in the safest balance between two extremes. Now, this fits with, with Schleiermacher's overall understanding of education, which is a very interesting and important one. He saw education as being about action and theory that focused on the reconciliation of opposites. These opposites include theory and practice, particularity and generality, present and future, supporting and counteracting, and also one could add proximity and distance. Now, present and future is particularly important um, because it comes up later in the, in the history of pedagogical tact. And what Schleiermacher is referring to here is the idea that children are located in the present and in some ways engaged in an affirmation of the present that is not available to us easily as adults. And that's in part because of their, what, could one, what, one, what one could call their different awareness of the future. We are concerned with the future, that the future is driving our actions um, as part of our plans and part of our, um, who we are as adults. Children are not the same. They are, again, oriented towards the present in ways that we are not. So Schleiermacher asked the question, how can we as educators make sure that we are not unnecessarily sacrificing the present for the sake of the future. And sacrificing the present for the sake of the future is something that happens all the time when children are asked to focus and to work hard in school, in other educational and pedagogical contexts. Proximity and distance, meanwhile, refers to the pedagogical relation between the educator and the person being educated. Um, it can be this proximity and distance, distance can be understood both literally and figuratively in which, uh, and so the educator can be understood as being present and even insistent in helping the student or ensuring the student completes the task. At the same time, that type of proximity is limited in its effectiveness because the child or the person being educated is expected to become autonomous, to do things for themselves, which requires distance. Finally, Schleiermacher refers to or understands tact in the context of the primacy of practice, uh, primata praxis, and also the dignity of practice. And what these refer to is the idea that, unlike Habot, Schleiermacher did not see theory and practice as being two equals and two opposites in education all the time. Instead, he saw practice as actually having a certain primacy, greater importance, greater dignity than theory. And he saw theory as always trying to catch up to what was being done in practice. So again, we have a, a long kind of break in our history of pedagogical tact. And this comes to an end with the work of Hermann Noel. And he talks about tact in human science pedagogy. Now, human science pedagogy is a sort of a movement or a school, um, and Noel was one of its most prominent representatives. Um, human science pedagogy followed Schleiermacher, in a sense, in, in emphasizing the importance of practice. And they understood, the human science pedagogues understood their theories as being a theory of practice for practice. So they attempted to remain very close to practice and to um, develop theories and guidelines and rules um, that would be of direct relevance for teachers. This opposition and entwinement, this is now Noel talking about pedagogical tact, constitutes the pedagogical stance. And what Noel is talking about there is he's talking about the opposition and entwinement of the teacher or educator's view of the child or the one being educated 
um, as being existing in tension between the present and the future. And so there's opposition and entwinement going on there. And it not only constitutes the pedagogical stance, it gives the educator a singular distance to his subject as well as to his student. So Noel is talking here about um, both curricular subjects and also um, the person being educated, the student. In its most refined expression, this distance is called pedagogical tact. And he sees pedagogical tact, again, as kind of a balancing. Um, this is a it's a tact which does not offend the young person where the educator wants to advance or protect him. So it does not um, intrude into the, into the child or the student's understanding of themselves uh, in a sharp or overt way. Um, whether the educator is attempting to give them space or to come and help them. Also, it allows the educator to sense when a great matter is not to be pedagogically trivialized. So, um, so that personal issues and other um, things that come up are not just to be dismissed for the sake of pedagogical expediency. Now, Noel's definition is from 1933. The, another uh, set of definitions come up for pedagogical tact after the Second World War. 1933, of course, was the beginning of the era of national socialism in Germany, and um, a, number, a number of things happened uh, during that era, of course, which are really key to the, the history of tact. On the one hand, and this comes up right away, uh, it, there is the idea that there was no tact, or that there was... Uh, I, that tact was essentially kind of destroyed, as were conventions and traditions that to which tact might actually relate. At the same time, there uh, it, there was a diaspora and, a, and an em, a, a emigration of um, Jewish intellectuals and other intellectuals from Germany. Elizabeth Blochmann is one of these Jewish intellectuals, uh, as is Adorno. However, unlike Adorno, Elizabeth Blochmann fled to England and she um, worked as a professor at the Oxford University in, um, in the UK. Here's what she said. Not only I, but other German educators who, like me, found a new field of work as emigrants in England, have had to learn one thing above all, regardless of where they were employed, whether it's a kindergarten, a school, or a university. And that one thing is a much greater composure and restraint towards young people. So what Blochmann is saying is that she, when she was in exile in Oxford and teaching, she saw that there was a different way in which older people, educators, related to people that they were educating. And she saw this as being valuable and, and representing an alternative to what had been going on in Germany um, for... Uh, for decades before. So she describes this as follows. One is all too easily inclined as an educator to be too aggressive and to intervene violently in a young life. So she's acknowledging the fact that educators used violence as a tool um, in Germany during the Nazi era and the decades pr uh, prior to the Nazi era. This became clear only to, to me only in England we need much more Gelassenheit in education, she says. After all, everything that is right and good can only be achieved in the long run if young people grow up unbroken, unoppressed, and secure in themselves. So this sounds like something that's obvious today, and the, the idea of using violence is all something that we don't consider, um, except as a criminal act. At the same time, though, what's important here is how she's defining tact, um, pedagogical tact, as governing or as being a part of the relationship between teacher and student. And she's saying that tact is no longer a question about action, as, which is how Herbot defined it, and now is a question about of not acting, knowing when not to act, knowing um, when to exercise Gelassenheit, which again refers to releasement and to letting be and letting go. And so we, we see a new or a new emphasis in the in the history or in the conception of pedagogical tact emerging both with Noel and especially with Blochmann here, which is one that emphasizes the restraint of the teacher or the educator, the, their, the release of the student to freedom 
and a, a careful distance between student and teacher. So we can also understand what Blochmann is saying in light of Adorno's understanding of the precondition of tact being convention no longer intact yet still present. We can see this as being illustrated in the case of Blochmann because she is talking about the fact that the traditions in Germany, conventions in Germany from before the war, or during the war, no longer have any credibility. They've in a sense been destroyed. At the same time, she is drawing attention um, to the idea that there are conventions and ways of engagement that exist elsewhere that Germany can use or that teachers or that teachers in Germany could use as an example. So we have convention no longer intact or die in sich gebrochen ist, and, uh, but that is still can be understood as something present that, that Blochmann is saying, this is a way of doing things that, that is real and actual, even though it, it, it exists from us at some distance. In 1962, two decades after Blochmann's articles appeared, um, a guy named Jakob Muth published a book called Pedagogical Tact. And in this, this is the first book on the subject of pedagogical tact that we have. And he followed Blochmann. In fact, he quotes Blochmann and expresses his appreciation for what she has done. And he also says that tact and pedagogical tact is about sensitivity and reserve. And he says, the general meaning of tact um, is especially constituted by the concepts of sensitivity and reserve as its two essential defining moments. He goes on. The sensitivity which characterizes that which is tactful is a feeling for the you or the thou or the do for one's fellow human being and for the singularity and singular rights of the other of this person it is a respect for the ultimate inaccessibility of the other so what Moot is saying is very important here because he's um, anticipating further developments in the understanding of pedagogical tact that actually become a problem for pedagogical tact what he's saying is that the bourgeois individual that, that Adorno said appeared at the end of the 18th century is changing and the way and, and the needs and requirements of this person in relationship to social relations and pedagogical relations is different. And what he's saying is that there is something inaccessible about um, at the core of one's identity and who one is, inaccessible to other people especially to educators and to uh, teachers. And this creates a problem. The idea would be to find a way of acting that would be appropriate for this lack of knowledge, this untouchable kind of center or unknowable uh, character of the person that we are engaged with. Also, it represents a definite break from the time of, or the way of thinking of Habat and uh, also Noel, I believe in the sense that pedagogy and pedagogue, no, pedagogues, no matter how expert they may be, are not able to, to know or to understand what, uh, what, the, what the child or what the student needs or what, what is going on um, in their interiority. So the other and the individuality of the other um, become inaccessible, become more increasingly absolute in the, their singularity and uniqueness, because he uses the word singularity and singular here twice. And uh, when he talks about a feeling for the you or the thou or the do, what he's doing is he's talking about using the familiar or kind of more intimate form of address. Um, and he is emphasizing the fact that this happens in relationships that are, that are close. Um, he's also referring to uh, a theologian and philosopher, Martin Buber, who talks about the I and the thou or the ich and the du relationship. And Buber says that the you fills the sky and when we are engaged with another and that becomes, they become for a moment, everything. This, however, is also a problem. And Adorno is the one who points out this problem in talking about tact further. He says, convention, uh, custom, traditions represented the universal, which made up the very substance of the individual claim. So here he's making an important dialectical move. He's saying, 
that the individual is not just the opposite of the universal, but rather is also dependent on the universal. Because if the individual asks to be treated according to their individuality, they still require some sort of reference to how one would treat others, what would normally go on in, in social circumstances, which would be a question of convention. He continues, yet when emancipated, tact confronts the individual as an absolute without anything universal from which to be differentiated. It fails to engage the individual and finally wrongs him. It helps what is most universal, naked external power to triumph even in the most intimate constellations. So what Adorno is saying here is that, is that tact is in a way disappearing. And the reason that it's one of the reasons that it's disappearing is because of the fact that the individual, the bourgeois individual, the subject and their interiority are enlarged to such a degree that they make it impossible to also at the same time have a universal or a set of, of common conventions to refer to. What Adorno says is that as a result of this inflation, this enlargement of the subject and their, their concerns and their uniqueness and singularity, what happens is that tact becomes impossible and it switches over to its dialectical opposite, which, which could be called tactics or naked external power or the idea of simply using somebody as a means to one's own end. Why does this happen? Well, Adorno explains it as follows. He, in a, a text called On Subject and Object from 1956, Adorno writes, the more individuals are in effect degraded into functions within the societal totality as they are connected up to the system, the more the person, pure and simple, as a principle, is consoled and exalted with the attributes of creative power, absolute rule, and spirit. So what he's saying is that, in some ways, the more the self and the individual is absolutized as being the only thing that matters, the only thing that fills the sky, um, the, the more it is in effect trivialized and reduced to something that is undifferentiated because of uh, within the context of, a, of the social organism or machine. So the subject is at the same time inflated and saturated and is, and is also shrunken and emptied. So we can find examples of this in our current uh, everyday life. This includes things like privacy. So instead of having private rooms that we retreat into, which was a key characteristic of the, of the bourgeoisie, we now post everything that we have on Facebook or online and through um, Snapchat or, or TikTok or something. And we aren't private as individuals. Our individuality, individuality does not consist in that privacy. This also then means that that interiority, in a sense, is not something that um, that is a dominant part of experience in the way that it, that it once was. In the sense, again, that we don't have secrets or things that only we know that constitute a sort of internal reality for us. And also mobility, which is a characteristic of bourgeois society, is also disappearing today as the difference between the poor classes and the richer and the richest classes becomes ever larger. Now, it's interesting to note that Praya in his 2017 book, Educate with Tact, actually refers to Adorno in talking about the idea of the eclipse of tact or the finstonness of tact, the dis its disappearance. He says that the cult of authenticity of the individual is one of the three reasons for the disappearance of tact. And he refers to Charles Taylor, who is a philosopher um, of Hegel. Charles Taylor says, authenticity, because it implies originality, calls for a revolt against convention. So again, we see this direct opposition between the individual and their, willing, their ability or their desire to be authentic, to be who they are, to be unique, as, as very da as de ultimately damaging to convention and to tradition and uh, customs. A second factor, Paria says, is that society is becoming increasingly juridified. 
um, is becoming increasingly plural, is no longer constitutes a type of tight community or uh, what Tony's referred to as a Gemeinschaft. Instead, it has become a Gesellschaft where the relationships between individuals are governed by, by explicit laws and contracts rather than being a question of implicit trust or um, proximity. Finally, the third reason has to do with technology, with rationalization and disenchantment. In all of these three reasons, Max Weber's thought plays an important role. Max Weber was a sociologist from the late 19th century who, who identified many of these key issues in modern society. So what Paria says is that technology was originally conceived with the sole ambition of increasing our independence. Its only ideal has been the conquest of self-sufficiency. So what he's saying is that technology basically serves the desire, the, the character of the bourgeois individual to be self-sufficient and independent and to define themselves precisely in terms of their individuality. At the same time though, as we know, this has the result of the individual becoming absolute and technology, social complexity, questions of authenticity all combine together to, to make tact something that is essentially almost impossible. However, Paria says that there actually are ways of getting attacked. And he gives emphasis to the idea that we can recover tact. Teachers and t student teachers can learn um, or become oriented towards tact or tactfulness through the use of examples. Here he's talking about positive examples. And he says, tact is a virtue of improvisation. It feeds on and is impregnated with exemplary forms, with examples because improvisation is never a creation ex nihilo or out of nothing. It always draws on the source of successful forms and acts. So in being able to make a decision that hopefully meets the needs of the individual child, we don't simply, we're not, not so much thinking about theory anymore here. We're actually thinking about other people's examples or exemplary examples that we can recall perhaps from even from our own teaching and experience. He says, it always draws on the source of successful forms and acts and is something that calls for a form of reflexivity. So a second important characteristic is that we are reflective, we th we're thinking and we are, um, we, are, we are looking at and considering what, what, it, what we've done in the past, what others have done, and what is possible in the, um, in the present. He also says, secondly, there are all, only examples in the plural. So it's always a question of e exemplary forms, not a single exemplar that is simply the paradigm for how to teach or how to deal with, um, with children and, and young people as individuals. So he says, we can now clarify what is meant by a pedagogy of dilemmas, which is his key idea for understanding pedagogical tact. Let me just talk about the example for a second, because the idea of the example is a very important one. And we use examples, refer to examples all the time in uh, academic and other types of discourse and writing. And so in English, you use the abbreviation EG, um, in German is zum Beispiel, ZB, and this goes back to Aristotle and uh, the etymology or the history of the word um, example. And an example is something that is taken out of a whole, for example, out of the whole of a broader experience or out of the whole of a theoretic, of theoretical universality. Um, Beispiel is an interesting term too, because it sort of refers to something that is at play um, but it's only neighbor and by. It's only um, incidental or um, or on the side of what is one what, what one is primarily concerned with. Now the intellectual function of examples, like tact, actually, is to mediate the general and the particular. So their mediation of the general and particular is illustrated by the idea that you would refer to one specific student or one specific incident as an illustration of a more general concern or a more general 
uh, type of tactfulness. Examples really are significant in that they challenge theory. So they, they certainly mediate between and they bring together in general in particular. They try to do this. Um, but at the same time, just an example on its own is a challenge to theory. And here's what Irene Harvey, who's written about examples, has to say about this. She says that the functioning of examples has not been, and perhaps of necessity, cannot be saturated by theory. Examples retain a secret of their own. So what she's saying is that no matter how we might come look at an example and then come back and understand how it fits with theory, the details and the specificity of the example always go beyond any theoretical conclusion that we can arrive at. They, they're never exhausted by just one discussion or one, uh, one type of generalization. And so there is a, th a really important affinity that the example has to both tact and to pedagogy. Examples in some ways point to a generality that exists beyond themselves. And this kind of pointing to general things is a key pedagogical or didactic act or action. And um, the example, while it does this, remains on the side of particularity. So just as with tact, the idea of an example, the idea that there's something valuable in, this, in the particularity of practice is where tact in a certain sense is located, what it, where it, it's where it has its effect. And that's also the case with the example. So tact and examples are not just similar, um, but rather one can serve the other um, in, in various ways. Pavia talks about this in, in discussing his pedagogy of dilemmas. He says that this approach to helping student teachers become tactful has three objectives. The first, he says, is to help future teachers to identify moral issues and to make them aware of the tensions that can run through and affect professional practice. So again, by talking now, uh, not so much about positive examples, but rather about examples of educational dilemmas, it allows, it, it allows the teacher or student teachers to think about and to reflect momentarily on what is happening and to understand the moral kind of consequences and the, the professional um, values and perhaps conflicts that might be involved. And in thinking about dilemmas and examples, it becomes possible then to think in these ways more easily and more quickly um, in the context of actual practice. The second objective, he says, is to familiarize the student teachers with the practice of deliberation. And again, we, we talked about reflexivity and the importance of reflection, and we'll talk about it more in conjunction with the final book on tact that I, that I look at. He says, finally, the third and the last objective is to lead the trainee to, or the person becoming a teacher to decree and justify his ethical choices. So what he's saying here is that um, by looking at dilemmas in, in a group, in a classroom, um, on video, for example, or described textually, we can reflect and, and discuss what is important and what kind of ethical understandings and, and values are behind any particular choice or any particular judgment about a situation. So the final book on pedagogical tact that I'm going to talk about is uh, one by Daniel Belcott and Jörg Zerfas. It was published in 2019 and like Praia, it actually emphasizes tact not so much as a solution, as a way of acting quickly to do the exact, the exact appropriate thing at the moment it's needed, but rather um, as a way of problematizing um, the pedag uh, pedagogical matters. And that is why it's called a problem formal, which is hard to translate into English. Pedagogical tact, they say, is here decidedly not understood as a formula for the solution of pedagogical problems. But it is understood as a formula for the problematization for pedagogical issues. We understand this term problematization in the sense of the Latin problema, a task or that which is proposed or a question as one etymology describes. And so we regard pedagogical tact as something offered, something put forward as an inescapable pedagogical question 
So it's not the answer, it's the question. And now with Birk Hutton's Vivas. It's a question that does not primarily aim at solutions, but at the generation and discussion of further pedagogical questions. It defines the problematic nature of certain kinds of pedagogical action and initiatives, and it identifies and differentiates the dimensions of associated problems. So what they're saying is that pedagogical tact can be understood as, again, in terms of dilemmas, in terms of aporias, in terms of issues that and, and questions that have no single answer, but that need to be, uh, or that lie at the core of what it is to be pedagogical, that need to be evaluated, discussed, and um, understood both by practitioners and others. So pedagogical tact here becomes not a way of acting and intervening quickly and appropriately, but rather as a way of understanding what might have gone wrong, what might go wrong, as a way of dealing with dilemmas. So it's a very different conception of pedagogical tact that we've arrived at. And we can say then that there's a kind of a dialectic of tact that happens over the last 200 or more years. Tact begins its life in, in a way as a, as a both a pedagogical and a social um, notion as a capacity or an attitude or a skill. And it's something that's demonstrated um, through activity and intervention. So whether we're talking about um, whether we are talking about Habat and his notion of of a capable action, or we're talking about even Dugald Stewart and the way that he talks about feeling one's way through a situation, a social situation. Tact also at this time becomes or is understood as a way of mediating between theory and practice. Um, mediating, mediating between other antipodes like uh, or opposites in, in that constitute the field of educational theory and practice like um, proximity and distance or present and future. Finally, tact at this time is tied very closely with the emergence of the bourgeois individual as somebody who precisely who whose identity is wrapped up with their individuality and who therefore asks for appropriate ways or un, unscripted ways of uh, engagement, social engagement. In the, from the 1950s through to the 1980s, tact is understood as a kind of capability, attitude, or skill. It is dem demonstrated through passivity, through non-intervention, and through an encounter with the, the thou, the other, and their singularity. So tact still remains a kind of capacity, a way of being able to act in a particular way, but it's defined precisely in terms of non-action, in terms of knowing when not to not to intervene, knowing how to keep a, a appropriate distance from the one who is learning, the one who is being educated, and and also being being able to let things go, to to let be, to uh, release. This corresponds with an understanding of the individual being taught as one whose uniqueness and authenticity become ever more challenging to essentially accommodate and to uh, connect to, to, to any kind of tradition or custom that might provide some guidance for tactful engagement. Finally, in the Renaissance, the reconsideration of pedagogical tact that we've seen happen over the last 10 years or so, tact changes again. It becomes a problematization or a heuristic or a kind of a tool for analysis and for acquiring sensitivity in pedagogical situations. And this kind of tact works through examples and reflection and is not so much, again, the idea of action kind of drops off, uh, drop, disappears from view. And, and then the question becomes, well, if there's been a renaissance in tact, if it's now been, tact is now understood as a way of problematizing and asking questions about, say, the relationship between theory and practice or the relationship between distance and proximity in teaching and working with others. What does that say about our current society? What does that say about um, Adorno's understanding of tact needing to have broken but still present conventions 
or customs and ways of acting and ways of orienting ourselves. I'm going to leave you with that question and uh, just mention the sources that I've used. Um, I've mentioned most of them explicitly. One that is important is by Morton Korsgaard. He has an article on exemplary, exempl exemplarity and education that I've used. And I just want to draw your attention explicitly to the book that I've recently translated and published that is called Tact and the Pedagogical Relation. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I look forward to hearing back from you.